Hi, have you ever thought about what is experimental testing really all about? Uh, when I do experimental testing, I usually do it to get enough data so I can calibrate a material model for a finite element simulation. And if my goal is limited to that, that kind of activity, then the question I'm thinking about is, what is the best experiment to run? How many experiments do I need to run? And what should these experiments look like? Um, and that brings up the whole concept of smart testing. Clearly, if I think a lot about this and I do the right tests, some tests will be better than others, and those tests are what I would call smart tests. So as an example, if I'm working with a piece of rubber, a rubber may be stretched. If I stretch it to 1% in my test machine and I record the stress strain response, that's useful. I get some information about the stress strain response of that rubber. That's very good. But what if I took another specimen of the same material and I pulled it to 10% strain instead of 1% strain? Is that a better test? After all, it contains all the information from the first test that was to 1% strain, but then also information up to 10% strain. So one could argue that the 10% version of that test is better. It's a smarter test. It gives me more information for practically the same amount of time and money. So I would say that that's a clear indication that, huh, there is something to work on here, something to think about in order to get the most value out of your test specimens when you trying to calibrate a material model. So what is the thing we want to think about here? Well, that's really that most materials of polymers, the rubbers, thermoplastics, uh, adhesives, they are viscoelastic or viscoplastic in the response. So we need to have that in mind as we designed our smart tests. So we get the information we need with as little time and effort as possible. And uh, really, the, I think a very useful way to achieve that is to do cyclic tests. So instead of just pulling it to 10% strain or 50% strain, I pull on it to a certain strain and then I hold the strain constant. So here's an example of a type of experiment that I often promote. So in this case, uh, here you see the strain history versus time. This is what I program my test machine to do. I go to say 2% strain, I hold it for about 10 seconds, I unload to almost 0% strain, and then I load it to a larger strain. I keep doing these larger and larger cycles until the specimen fail, or uh, I am clearly outside the range of interest of strains. So this is useful. It gives me both the loading, the unloading response, therefore the, the how much of the, the material can recover during unloading. It also tells me about the, the, how much that relaxes as a function of strain at different points in time. This is actually kind of a smart test, isn't it? It has all that information built into it. Another test that could be useful is to uh, run a repeated cycles to the same level of strain. How about this? How about if I go to 2% strain, I hold it, unload it, and then go back to 2%, in this case, three times, and then I go to another uh, load level or strain level, 5% strain, and I repeat that, and so forth. What's the value of this? Is this a better test? Is this a smarter test? Um, it depends, but it clearly seems like it's actually slightly better, isn't it? Because it says that during the first time we load to 2% strain and unload, if we repeat that, we can see if the material has been damaged. Does it reach the same stress the second time? How different is it? How much does it change with cycles as we repeat that? And then we re uh, go on to larger strains. So it gives us slightly more information about this, the concept of damage. And this is, of course, useful for some materials that are known to exhibit damage, like rubbers and the Mullins effect. Um, for thermoplastics, the damage is not so common at these levels, but it can occur in larger strains. So this is another type of test that uh, is clearly uh, somewhat smart in its design. It has all these components to it in terms of what we get out of a single specimen. Can we do something else? Can we be even smarter about it? I'm gonna give you two examples of um, tests that, that I sometimes do in order to show how this can work. So let me open the first one here. So here is another test that uh, shows us the cyclic response of a, a, a polyethylene in this case. So if you look on the figure to the right, uh, in this case, I tested this material to about 5%, no, 5 megapascals stress in compression. 
Then I unloaded it to zero stress and I kept doing that about 10 times. And then I went to a larger stress, 10 megapascals. I cycled it and then I kept doing that to larger and larger strains. Well, we see that after each uh, cycle here, the material will kind of creep away during the cyclic test, but it gives you a lot of information about how much plasticity occur, how much does it change, and so forth. So this is a relatively good test, but it's a little bit more difficult to analyze. So this is usually not my preferred way of doing these tests, because we have, we're running this in stress control and we're going all the way back to zero stress. So this is a little difficult to do numerically. You may have buckling. If your material model is not quite right, they may end up in compression. So I typically don't prefer to do it all in stress control as in this test. Another type of experiment, and this is the last one I'll show, is, is to do this kind of test. I think this is a fascinating test. It has a lot of information. It kind of brings together the idea of, let's think about how we should do testing here to get the most information for our material model calibration. So this is a, a thermoplastic material that I tested in uniaxial tension to various uh, strain levels. I then held the strain constant for a little bit and then I unloaded it to compression, to the same strain level in compression. I held it a little bit and then I went back and forth. So you can see that there are a lot and lot of cycles here, but from a single test, we can see how the stress strain curve rolls over. We can see how much the stress relaxation increases as a function of strain, both in tension and in compression. We can see the difference in yield stress between tension and compression, which is relatively common in thermoplastics. And we see the recovery during unloading, the nonlinear nature during uh, unloading that is also very common for thermoplastic. Tons of information from a single test. Uh, so this is another one that is very useful to do. This is a little difficult, of course, to do this because it goes both to tension and compression. But the idea here is to make you think about what specific smart tests you can do to maximize the information you get out of your experiments and then get the best material model and best products in the end when you do your finite element simulations. So if you have any thoughts about this, if you have any suggestions of what you think are the best smart tests, write them in the comments below. I'm looking forward to see what kind of ideas you have.